is at Let's do this. It's my great pleasure to introduce Paula. Um, uh, she's at John Hopkins. Uh, she will be uh, uh, giving a talk. Very interesting topic. Uh, and, and, and one of these um, uh, human uh, capability that we have of, of automatically segmenting um, uh, human speech, but that you would think computers can do but it is a challenge. There are so many aspects of this and, uh, and, and, and many applications. And so it's great to have Paula uh, talk about uh, this topic of speaker diarization, She's currently assistant research scientist at John Hopkins, uh, but she's done uh, many interesting work in this direction, including a very highly uh, successful competition uh, a few years back uh, on the same topic. So uh, without more details, uh, my pleasure to have Paula talk with us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the introduction. It is my very great pleasure to be with uh, you today. Uh, we are going to talk about adarization and what is this adarization thing in this world full of DNS. So my name is Paola Garcia, late me Paola Garcia Pereira. So those ones are my four names. And um, I'm an assistant research scientist at the Center for Language and Speech Processing at Johns Hopkins University. So let's go to it. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all my collaborators. Uh, thanks to each one of them, this uh, work is all possible because of them. Uh, from JHU, the students, and also um, our faculty colleagues from NTU uh, as well, uh, and some of the students and uh, faculty from CMU, of course, uh, Shinji, thanks a lot for everything. Uh, some other collaborators around the world uh, from uh, different universities. Um, a special thanks for, uh, for Hitachi. Uh, this work is also possible because, because of them. And also special thanks for the Center for Child Wellbeing and Development for collecting um, uh, such a nice data that I'm gonna present in the final uh, stage of this presentation. Um, so um, I know that there are a lot of fascinating works out there about darization. These are just a few ones which um, somehow I have been involved in. Uh, so, uh, I, I would like also to, to thank the, the collaborators and also the non-collaborators that make this work possible. And so first I start with what is the goal of, of darization? What, is, um, what information is included in the speech? So we can extract a different information from, from the speech, for example, uh, the transcription, the speaker ID, the emotion, the language. We are just gonna center on the derization. So what is derization? Derization answers the question, who spoke when in the recording? So we can get like uh, chunks of the audio, like um, shown in the figure. For example, we have a speaker one, a speaker two, and a speaker three. And we just put them together and we, we just um, make up, uh, attack them if they belong to the same speaker or not. After that, we can also come up with uh, different downstream tasks. For example, um, after having this segmentation per speaker, we can do uh, speech recognition or emotion recognition. But let's first observe uh, what is happening here. We have the speech signal, and then we somehow uh, tag the different speakers. We can see that there is a gap in here between uh, speaker, the, the first chunk of speaker one, and there is also a gap between the speaker two. So uh, this is because um, uh, there is a silence here, and there's also a silence here. We can also observe that in real life, we don't, we don't like um, um, speak um, one at a time, that we uh, usually have overlapping speak, speech. Uh, for example, we have two speakers talking at the same time, in this case, a speaker two and a speaker three. And also it can, it can happen that we can have a speaker imbalance. For example, uh, we can observe that speaker 
three has much more audio or much, much more uh, speech than a speaker. So let's uh, uh, think about these problems that are also part of the authorization. In the end, uh, the authorization, uh, as I said before, can be combined with other downstream tasks as, as ASR and others. And how, uh, uh, how authorization is useful in this, uh, in this world? So, well, uh, one of the, third, the first things that comes to our mind is to um, address the, the meetings. So if we have a meeting and we want to, to, um, to see who's speaking when and also get the transcription, then we will be using derization in a patient um, doctor scenario as well. So uh, we can monitor uh, the patient by uh, extracting uh, the, the speech. And if we want to extract also the uh, speech from, uh, from the doctor, it can, also, it can also be useful to address quality of, ser of service. And um, I would also like to talk about uh, child center speech because I, I work uh, on that as well. So there are like several studies where um, what we have what we have what we do is to uh, get some recorder and put it in the vest and then make uh, the kids, especially the to toddlers, wear it and uh, the toddlers go from here to there and we can record from, let's say, a couple of minutes to nine hours. And what we want to, to get from, uh, from these recordings is uh, information about the interaction happening around the kids and also um, uh, between the kids and the family or, or the environment around them. And this study is quite interesting because it can serve other fields uh, such as cognitive science and linguists, uh, and also the linguists that uh, study the, uh, the uh, child, um, the language development, especially in toddlers. And right now the cocktail party is getting uh, quite popular. What, what happens if we have like multiple speak, multiple um, microphones on a table and we want to uh, record and should we, uh, we uh, are we going to be able to derive those recordings when all the people are talking at the same time, having their own conversations? So these are the things that uh, involve uh, derivation. Um, I forgot to say that just interrupt me at any time if you have like uh, any questions or suggestions or concerns. Um, I think I'm not able to see the, the chat or probably yes, but I just like, uh, uh, you, just, you just have to uh, stop me, okay? So um, who spoke of when in, in the recording? This is the main goal of, of the derivation. And in here we have just a very a simple pipeline of how we do derivation. So the first stage uh, from the speech signal is to get like a voice activity detection to get rid of the silences. Then the, the second part is uh, just because I work on child-centered speech is um, to tag um, the, different, the different chunks into a gender and also distinguish between uh, kids and adults and also between devices and uh, real persons. After that, we can do what is a properly uh, named derivation, that is um, tag in each of the chunks with the appropriate uh, speaker uh, label. As we see here, we have this uh, three speakers. Uh, be before going further, let's uh, see uh, how good our derivation uh, is. And let's define our metrics. We have two essential metrics. The first one is the derivation error rate. The second one is the uh, jacquard error rate. The derivation error rate is just a sum of uh, the false alarm, the misdetection, the speaker error over the total duration of the recording. So the, uh, the false alarm is the duration of non-speech mistakenly classified as a speech. The misdetection is the duration of a speech incorrectly classified as non-speech and the confusion or a speaker error uh, is the duration of the speakers classified 
as another speaker. At the Jackal error rate, for the Jackal error rate, we need a, re a reference speaker. So this comes from the ground truth. That means that those ones are the real, real speakers. And for each of these reference speakers, uh, we sum up the false alarms and the misdetections over a total. In this case, this total belongs to the um, uh, union of the reference speakers and also the hypothesis speakers. If we want to get a global jackal error rate, we just get the average of the individual um, jackal error rates. So this is um, the traditional way how we do derivation. Um, so the, this is uh, still uh, for some tasks, uh, the state of the art, but of course we are jumping uh, towards uh, the end-to-end -end systems, but it is good to know how this uh, traditional derivation approach works. So the big uh, boxes are the essential parts that are needed for derivation. The blue ones are the ones that well, uh, can be optional, but uh, that are good to have in any case. So we have the speech signal. Guess, let's go through each one of them. So we have the speech signal, and then we have an en enhancement stage to get rid of mitigate the uh, the noise. Then we have we uh, have uh, the voice activity detection to uh, get rid of the silences. So we end up with uh, just the segments of, of uh, chunks of speech. With this uh, segments of the speech, we subsegment them into desired uh, lens. And from this subsegments, we generate embeddings. These embeddings are just a mathematical representation of those, of those subsegments. Sub and then we perform what is called the uh, scoring. This uh, scoring is um, um, uh, the, um, the comparison, all versus all of these embeddings. So we are comparing somehow the, the, the embeddings that uh, come from the subsegments from the speech and we get some scores. There are several ways on how to do it. For example, we have the uh, um, uh, cosine scoring or we have the uh, deep clustering, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, um, the PLDA. And with that in mind, uh, we can get a set of of scores that can tell us how similar are these embeddings among themselves. After that, we can do the clustering. That means we, we can put together the segments that belong to specific speakers, as we can see here. And uh, from this clustering, we uh, can get what is called the RTTM. The RTTM is just a list of durations or timestamps of the speech that have also uh, the tag of the different speakers. For this clustering, there are also different flavors. We started with the agglomerative hierarchical clustering, then we jumped to the um, uh, uh, variational based hidden Markov model X vector clustering. That sounds uh, really complicated, but it's not that complicated. And we also have the deep clustering. Um, and from after the clustering, of course, uh, we can get the, the RTTM. And if we want to get fancier, if we want to uh, refine those timestamps for each of the speakers, we use what is called the resegmentation using, uh, again, uh, an algorithm called the variational uh, based hidden Markov model to do that. I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and also, if we want to address the overlap, that means, as we said before in our uh, first slide, uh, how to address when two people are talking at the same time, we use what is called the overlap assignment. So we detect the regions where we have um, more, two or more speakers talking and we assign them um, uh, the different speakers according to some um, uh, probability. So this is uh, the way that we usually do derivation. And uh, from uh, this pipeline, I just selected a few, a few ideas that uh, I consider important. Of course, all of these uh, stages are, 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 uh, uh, should be considered as well 
but I just selected the, these three as the ones that I, I think that will really boost the performance. <laughs> so let's go um, to the embeddings first. Uh, the embeddings, we all know that the better the embeddings we have, the better the performance we will observe in the end. So here we have um, uh, some results that we got from the JSON 2019. Uh, we were looking for the exact combination of embeddings. We have the extended TDNN, and then we put some augmentation to the extended TDNN, and then we try the factor, the factorized TDNN, and we can see the improvements. And uh, after that, uh, there were other uh, uh, combinations or there were all other approaches on how to get the embeddings. For example, the uh, in the box converse 2019-20, uh, 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 the people from Microsoft, from Microsoft used the ResNet as uh, the core of their system, and it seems that it was working very good. Um, it, they got the, the first place, and in the last uh, box converse um, the recession challenge. So the ResNet 34 used by the people from uh, Duke and Lenovo also got like the best, the best results. So just for you to know that uh, the 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 more interesting the uh, the embedding is, the better performance you can get in the system. And this was uh, the first approach in which the DNNs came into the recession. Um, in the embeddings. The embeddings, of course, uh, can be also uh, the usual I, I vectors, the vectors, or any, any other kind of vectors. Uh, another key idea is the clustering. For the clustering, before the variational base heated Markov model, we use the agglomerative hierarchical clustering, and it was uh, the results were uh, okay. But we needed something that can really uh, deal with the X vectors. And this was, was the, the, the very first, first approach that used the X vectors to get uh, a sequence of, of speakers. So the way it works is very, uh, I won't gonna, it's, it's complicated, but um, it's very complex, but I can explain it in, uh, a, few, in a few words. So here uh, you can see that this is a hidden Markov model. And each of these states represents a speaker. We have the transitions as well, and we have the uh, probability loops, and that means the probability of the speaker uh, to maintain in, uh, in the same state. And um, you can see that each of these um, states follows a single Gaussian distribution. And this is just because uh, the parameters that we use for this in initialization uh, were from uh, a pre-trained model that is called PLDA. Uh, uh, it is a probabilistic linear discriminant analysis, which main goal was just to compare if two speakers are the same or not. So we just picked those um, parameters from the PLDA that it just happened to be that each of the speakers is modeled by a single Gaussian. It just, we just plug it here. And it really made the trick. And uh, we can see the results later. But there is another output that is very important from, uh, from, from this approach. From this approach, we can also get the posterior probabilities of each of the speakers. So uh, we can observe this one as a, called the Q matrix and uh, is a, a, speed, uh, a speaker attribution matrix. So we can see in the first line of the sequence of, of, of the speakers, the most likely a speak, uh, uh, speaker sequence, then in the second row, the second most likely a speaker sequence and wow. so on. So this is gonna be important for uh, when we are gonna talk about uh, overlapping uh, speech. And the output, of this, B, uh, of this BB, BBX, we call it for short, um, is the first, uh, the first row. That means this uh, sequence of the speakers, okay? And from this, we can always get the RTTM. And here I'm showing 
how good was the BBX at the time? It was 2018. So we are uh, showing here the results for the Die Hard 2 evaluation. The Die Hard is an evaluation that is composed of nine to 11 different subcorpora sub that go from one speaker up to different uh, speakers talking at the same time and also challenging conditions. You can observe here that the most challenging con uh, conditions are the seedlings, the bust and the seer. Seedlings, seedlings are child-centered speech, bust are YouTube videos and seer are restaurant, is a restaurant scenario. So you can see the, the results here that really drop from using agglomerative hierarchical clustering to using uh, the BBX. And uh, of course, I forgot to say, but uh, the lower the, 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 the recession ever, the better the, the system. And finally, we can jump to the overlap assignment. Uh, for the overlap assignment, the first thing that we need is an overlap detector. There are like several flavors of these uh, detectors. We can use uh, DNNs as well, and we can get the overlap and known overlap tags as is shown uh, in, the, in the first bullet. And this was performed also in the JSON workshop using Pyanode. We are, have also like a hybrid overlap detector that is in Caldi. And then uses the DNN and also a version of the hidden markup model and a deterby. So from the DNN, we obtained the overlap and non overlap procedures that are fed into the hidden markup model. And also the deterby can find the correct sequence of a speaker and silences, of a speech and silences in this, uh, sorry, of overlap and overlap, non overlap in this case. We use exactly the same. Um, architecture and the same idea to, to, to tackle the voice activity detector. So uh, having this in mind, uh, now that we have detected the regions where we have overlap, how are we gonna use them? Uh, as I said before, from the BBX, we can obtain this um, uh, posterior, uh, speaker posterior matrix. And we have here the most likely speakers, and we have here the second most likely speakers. So that is one of the outputs of the BBX. And from the overlap detection, we can get the regions where we have overlap uh, speech. Then we can merge it with the BAD, and we can come up with a sequence of speakers that contain both the most likely uh, speaker and also the, the second most likely speaker for the regions where we have the overlap. So this was the, the first time that the overlapping speech was addressed. And it gave uh, a slightly good, good improvement. So right now we, I'm showing you a comparison between uh, the Die Hard 1, the Die Hard 2, and the Die Hard 3. So uh, the difference between these three are that they include uh, a little bit more data uh, from Die Hard 1 to Die Hard 2. And then from Die Hard 2 to Die Hard 3, the uh, kids' data was uh, sadly taken out from the competition. Uh, but we have other um, uh, restaurant uh, data and also um, uh, more um, uh, telephone data that is the fissure. So we can see like a slight improvement from uh, going from the agglomerative hierarchical clustering and then using the PBX and then adding the overlap assignment. So um, this, this approach was very good at the time. It was 2018, 2019, but we really needed to handle the overlapping speakers in a natural way. And as, if, and as you can see, this pipeline is not optimized to minimize the derivation error rate, but each module has to be optimized separately. So we look for, for solutions. And the first solution uh, that came up was the region proposal network, or I mean in parallel <laughs> with other solutions. So this, was, this one was our first attempt here at, Hop, at Hopkins. 
It was inspired by the region proposal network that comes from, um, from image processing and uh, from the FAST uh, RCNN. So uh, the main goal of this uh, region proposal network is to tag the different objects that are in an image. The way to do it is um, on the right side, we have the procedure. So we have the image, we have a set of convolutional layers from which we can get some feature maps. And from those feature maps, we, uh, we um, applied a region proposal network that um, you can see that it, um, out, that it outputs the different proposals with um, a redundant information. And then we have to just like make sure that all of them are exactly um, in 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 um, uh, in a smaller uh, feature size. So that is why we use this region of interest pooling. And then once we have this, we can uh, we can make it an input to the classifier, and the classifier will be able to tag the different objects in in the image. So this, this looks quite nice, but uh, are we gonna be able to do it in a speech? So the answer is yes. So we have the speech signal here. We have, a, again, a bunch of neural networks, and then we uh, also uh, can uh, get some uh, region proposals and then a backend. And from that backend, we can get the RTT. Okay, so this was kind of, of easy to think but how, how easy it is to really put the things together. So uh, this is gonna sound uh, complex, but then you will see that, it's, uh, uh, that the losses are very easy to, to control. So we have the speech signal here, and then we can extract uh, some uh, features. In this case, the, those ones are given by the STFT. Then we have a convolutional, a set of convolutional networks from we can obtain from where we can obtain the feature maps. And then we have uh, a sliding window with the anchors. So these ones are uh, a predefined uh, segments which we can uh, enlarge them or make it smaller and we can put it, them in, the, um, in different locations. And these ones are our anchors. And we can see here that they look like some kind of, of, of proposals. Right. Then we uh, do some uh, dimensional, low dimensional mapping. Then we have a regression layer. Then we have a foreground, background a classifier. This regression layer just controls the timestamps of, of the different um, uh, speakers. And this uh, background foreground uh, classifier uh, give us a scores and we can get rid of the non very high quality um, segments. Then on the other branch, we obtain the feature maps as, as well after the CNN, but we just wanted to make sure that these feature maps after all of this process really represent the STFT as we saw before in, in the uh, picture for the fast RCNN. So we can really um, ensure that those ones are aligned. And uh, in here we have this, uh, what is called the darization head, that it includes an extra classifier for the speaker. So we have, again, a regression layer that can uh, refine the timestamps for the speakers, the foreground and the, uh, and the background classifier that give us some scores, and the speaker classifier that, depending on the scores, we can select the best embeddings for each, each speakers. And uh, having that, we can apply the non-maximal suppression, so algorithm to get rid of redundant information. After that, we uh, have already some kind of segments that are quite clean. We do the clustering, we merge them, and we get the RTTM. So uh, the pipelines is uh, quite, quite complex, but in the end, we just have to focus on the regression layer, the foreground, uh, background uh, classifier, and the speaker classifier. So these ones are the losses that control the rest of the system. As I said before, here is the, uh, the global loss that we are gonna uh, 
tackle. We have the, uh, the, uh, the part for the region proposal network loss and also the part for uh, the darization head. And let's see if this um, pipeline was useful. So we have the results again for the diehard and we have also the results for the diehard uh, best approach using the BBX. So we see like a very significant improvement in terms of the darization error rate and also in terms of jacquard error rate. And uh, our proposed approach is not as good as the BBX, but is better than the baseline. So since this is a, uh, uh, since this was the, the very first attempt, I think it was, it was good. Uh, but we still uh, don't know exactly how to handle the overlapping uh, speakers and how to really design a system in such a way that the darization error is minimized. And in this world uh, full of DNNs and every, everything going towards DNNs, how to make that possible? Uh, that was one of the questions that we have like uh, two years ago. So this is uh, the traditional way of doing the recession. So is it possible to use only one neural network? The answer is, is, is yes, but there is like a change of paradigm. So this is a multi-level approach. It's a predictive, multi, uh, multi, uh, sorry, a predictive modeling task that involves uh, predicting zero, or one or two classes. And um, I mean, you can, um, you can assign mutually non-exclusive class to the, uh, to the labels, right? So you can have uh, Dorothy and Lyle uh, on the same segment. And so you don't need, uh, you don't longer, you no longer need um, the overlap detection or the overlap assignment. And this was quite revolutionary. And the first people that did this was, uh, were the people from Hitachi with the end-to-end -end neural derivation. Um, I'm gonna explain briefly how the E-end evolved and how, what are the new trends right now. So the first uh, trial, it was kind of the uh, proof of concept. Uh, they were just trying to derive two speakers. We have here, the speech signal and then a bunch of neural networks and then from these neural networks we can obtain frame posteriors so for each frame we are going to get a posterior and we uh, are going to compute the binary entropy uh, for the different permutations and dependent on this uh, by doing this uh, permutation free loss that means minimizing the binary cross entropy, we can make sure that the derivation is correct. The output will be the sequence of speakers. And we have here uh, the equation to do, to, do, to do that. We can see that we are comparing the estimated, um, the estimated label with the estimate, with the a ground truth um, a label at the time t uh, with the permutation p. Okay, so, and then we, um, they came up with another approach that uh, can uh, also put different uh, speakers, fixed number of speakers. So we have the speech signal, then a bidirect bidirectional LSTM, and, and then from the direct bidirectional LSTM, we know that we can get some embeddings. These embeddings can be controlled um, using the deep clustering loss. The deep clustering loss, the, what it's going to do is that uh, it will make uh, the frames that belong to the same speaker to, to stick together and the frames that belong to different speakers to uh, be apart. And the output is again the frame posteriors. And, and then um, the transformer uh, came very popular. And um, so it has to be included into the E. And so we have again the speech, some uh, linear layer, and then the, the encoder block um, uh, was now um, transforming into a transformer. And this transformer is was a, a special kind because it does not include the positional 
encoding. So before, if you remember, the bidirectional uh, LSTM takes care of the uh, of the current, the past, and the future um, hidden states, and this uh, and this uh, self attention will take care of the complete um, of, of the complete uh, frames. So we just wanted to do that for this self attention uh, based approach. And then what happened is that up to here, we have no, a fixed number of speakers. So we have to tell the system how many speakers we are going to derive. And it was not, uh, not the best idea. So then uh, the, the EN encoder decoder attractor came. So this is a modification of the self-attention. So we start with the self-attention that was explained before this last one. And then um, from the self-attention EN, we uh, can obtain some kind of embeddings. And then we have an encoder decoder attractor, which um, is an LSTM uh, encoder that includes the, um, uh, hidden, uh, the, uh, the hidden state and also the cell, that last hidden and the uh, last uh, cell that is, um, also the input to the LSTM decoder. The LSTM decoders receive the H and C and also the some um, sequence of zeros. And with this sequence of zeros and with this H and C, we can get the attractors that are controlled uh, with a linear and a sigmoid layer, layer that can tell us the uh, existent, the attractor existence uh, probability that is just telling us if there is a speaker or not. With these attractors and combining them with the embeddings via uh, a dot product and a sigmoid layer, uh, layer we uh, get the darization result. And this was why quite revolutionary because now we can have an end-to-end -end system that is able to uh, get the sequence of the speakers and also can have flexible number of speakers at the same time. There are other flavors of, of EN. For example, we have this uh, speaker-wise uh, uh, condition EN that deals also with a uh, variable number of, of speakers. It's fully conditional mother. So first we have to obtain uh, a speaker one, a speaker two, and so on. And it works essentially as a sequence to sequence model. Um, we use also the teacher forcing in the training with a modification just to make sure that we are getting the appropriate permutation. And these are the results of what we were getting. Uh, remember that we were talking about our diehard evaluation. So we have here the diehard evaluation for the track one, that means that we are using the Oracle uh, speech activity detection. So we can see the improvement from a baseline. This baseline is uh, just based on expectors. We have here uh, the traditional system with the overlap assignment. We have then the EN with the uh, encoder, encoder decoder attractor, and then we have this speaker-wise condition EN. So we can see that um, the, the last three are are quite competitive among themselves. Probably the EDA is a little bit better. So we have a depth set and also a, an eval set. The difference between full and core, uh, the core is a balanced set. That means that from those uh, corpora that I presented earlier, it seems that they uh, contain exactly the, uh, around the same um, um, uh, length of audio. And uh, there are also another flavor that I want to talk about that is the online derivation EEN. In this case, um, uh, how to do uh, derivation that really performs online with a uh, minimum delay. So let's, let's get a, a, a look. So uh, we have like a first chunk that includes 10 frames, we apply the EEN, this is the flexible number of the speakers. It can be the EEN EDA or the uh, speaker um, condition, uh, the, the speaker wise, the speaker condition wise EEN. And then we obtain some output from the EEN. From this output, we select um, the frames 
that have higher probability. And then we, we create what is called the buffer. We're gonna put it here. And then um, we know that we might need some other uh, spaces for the future speakers. So we had a zero padding to this, uh, to this matrix. And then the second chunk, another 10 frames come and we add the buffer to this uh, second chunk. And we do again, the, uh, the, uh, we perform again the EEN. We solve for any permutation a problem because remember that the um, uh, that the speakers might be flipped, so we have to look into that again, and then we generate a buffer. Again, the buffer is again going to be stacked to the next um, uh, to the next chunk and so on, and we can get the timestamps in this way. So we just we're, we are just following the outputs. Uh, that are given by the uh, EEN uh, and, um, and um, controlling it with the buffer, okay? And these are some of the results that were shown for that paper. So there is an offline baseline that is uh, around 26% and then applying the EEN EDA uh, we, we came up with a 25 or 20, 25.3. And this is another study that is a, a kind of, of doing uh, the same thing. Um, and what if the system does not consider overlap? Let's say that our previous traditional systems, you, I, I, never, I never said that they consider overlap, except when I said that uh, we were um, gonna tackle the over, overlap detection and overlap assignment. But let's say that uh, we have systems like the BBX that does not consider the overlap. Is it possible to use the EEN as a post-processing stage? The answer is yes. So we have this nice output, let's say that it comes from the BBX. And what we are gonna uh, do is to get the, um, um, two largest sequence of speakers as in here, the lion and the tin man, and we are gonna put them together. Those are the frames for, for those speakers. Then we are gonna apply the EN, and then we are gonna um, solve uh, for any, any um, uh, permutation issue. Of course, there will be no permutation issue because uh, we know exactly who are the speakers, but we are gonna solve for these uh, overlapping regions. So we have, our first overlapping regions. Then we get the second, um, the second, um, the second chunk of, of of the speakers. That means we are gonna get Dorothy and we are gonna get the thin 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 man. So those ones were the next larger um, sequences. And then we are gonna plan the EEN. Then we can see that we found another uh, overlapping frames here and here. And then uh, in the end, the last combination will be uh, Dorothy and Lion. And then we can apply the EN again, and we find again, some kind of, of overlap. So we just put them together and we uh, end up with this uh, nice uh, sequence of speakers. So in summary, we get the labels from another system. We apply the EN. We solve for the permutation, if any, and we get the new labels with the overlaps. Uh, and now we are considering the two problems. We are able to handle the overlapping speakers and we uh, uh, have designed a system that is able to somehow minimize the darization error uh, with uh, this uh, equation, right? And what if we have multiple systems and we don't know how to uh, combine them in, in a nice way? So there is a way to deal with it. The name is Doverlap. Um, I know that there are um, better versions of the one that I'm gonna explain here, but uh, just for you to have uh, some knowledge on how Doverlap works. So the Doverlap uh, is composed of two stages. The first one is the label mapping and the second one is the voting. 
And uh, what we want to do with the label map mapping is to put all the labels in the same label space. So let's say that we have three different uh, systems with three different hypotheses. So we can compute the total cost for all possible combinations as is shown in the, in the figure until we get the global cost um, tensor. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the, um, we pick the lowest cost and we assign the same level to it. For example, here it will be A1, B2, and C4 will have the same level. And A3, B1, C1, we have uh, another label and so on. So we already have all the, uh, all the different uh, RTTMs in the same label space. And then we are going to use uh, a voting. Uh, we divide the regions and estimate the number of speakers in these regions. So the number of speakers is going to be the weighted mean of the number of speakers in the hypothesis, and the weights will be obtained by ranking the hypothesis by the total cost. So we can observe here that uh, we have uh, the two speakers, but for example, in here it's not clear, and probably it will just be the double lab will tell us tell us that it will be only one. In the end, we end up with this uh, nice solution, even though that in here uh, hypothesis B says that we might have an overlap. Um, the other hypothesis tell us no, so it's a no, and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, the tax for the Dorothy and uh, team. And uh, how, how is the, uh, the improvement if we include all of these systems all together? Now we are showing again the diehard three um, results. So the baseline again is the X factor, then there's the traditional system, uh, then the EDA, uh, the speaker wise condition, AEN, and the um, EN with um, uh, the EN end as a processing. So, and these are, as you can see, these uh, systems are quite competitive. What happens if we combine all together using the overlap? We can see a consistent improvement uh, in all of them for the uh, dev and also for the eval. Okay, so uh, can this idea of EN can be extended to all other tasks? The answer is yes, and we have been using it for language darization. So uh, this is an, um, an extension of the EN. So remember that we have the bidirectional LSTM for the EN that was able to handle the different speakers. In this case, we are, it's gonna be able to handle the different languages and it's gonna be controlled again with the deep clustering loss. So we are gonna get some embeddings from the bidirectional LSTM and this bidirection is this embeddings are going to be controlled with this uh, um, a deep clustering uh, loss. And we are going to get segment posteriors. We are not going to get uh, frame posteriors because these segments are um, uh, 200 milliseconds long. And we are not tackling uh, um, overlapping um, languages at the moment. Um, we consider that when you're talking uh, to a person, you use like only one language and you can do just the uh, code switching, but um, uh, it's not very common to have two languages in, in, the, in the same frame. And we also have the, the self-attention. So again, we have the speech, we have a linear layer, the encoder, la the encoder block, and this is the transformer. And uh, we made like uh, another modification to this self-attention that we call the X-vector self-attention. So this is the complete and detailed block of our best system. So as you can see here, you can have, um, this is the EN essentially, but for language. And we included here an X-vector um, pipeline. So we have the speech sample, we have the TDN, the TDNN layers, the, stat the statistics pooling, the linear, and from here we get some kind of embeddings. Uh, this is also controlled 
to get some loss that belongs to the X vectors. So this, this is an end-to-end -end model that is uh, joint, um, that is uh, training jointly uh, for the EEN part and also for the X vector. So that's why it's called X vector self-attention. So we included here the speech activity detection as part of, of the classes as we can observe here, the uh, is a hierarchical plus, uh, processing. We have a segment level of 200 milliseconds that um, uh, it is uh, processed by the X vector. So that is like a segment level information. And we have also a global dependency that is performed by the self-intention of the transformer encoder. And we were asking ourselves what is really happening in the heads of the transformer. So we have all, uh, also these uh, nice uh, pictures of the different heads. Um, the first results are from the workshop on speech technologies for code switching in multilingual communities. And the second one is from the CIMI data. Uh, both data sets are um, for code switching data. So you can have part of it in one language, and then it switches to another language. So we can observe here on the left side that we um, have like a linear transformation uh, with one, uh, one of the heads of, of the transformer. And then on, a second, uh, on the second head, we can have, um, um, the, 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 we can get like, it is uh, highlighting the different classes. The same happens to the CIMI data. Okay, we can clearly see here that is uh, showing some distinction for uh, for the Mandarin, for example. Mm -hmm. And we can observe the results uh, uh, as well uh, quantitatively. So we can see, for example, the comparison between the bidirectional LSTM, the self attention, and the X vector self attention. And um, we are using different matrix. Ma 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 matrix um, uh, metrics because uh, they're um, measured differently. So we uh, use the equal error rate and the accuracy. The equal error rate is on is just where the false alarm and the false rejection or or miss is the same as we show here in in the figure. And the accuracy is the usual accuracy, the corrective predictive class under the total um, testing classes. So um, for the equal error rate, the lower, the better. For the accuracy, the higher, the lower, the better. So we can see that the X vector self-attention is getting uh, the best results. And um, the same happens for, for the accuracy. These are the results for, for the workshop um, uh, challenge that it included English, Gujarati, Tamil, uh, Telugu. And also we've uh, put a silence as another class. And so why is this effort important? Um, it is important because we can use it for uh, different downstream, downstream tasks, such as ASR, uh, multi-microphone ASR, virtual assistance, broadcast transcriptions, emotion recognition. So everything that can come to your mind, we can use the verization as a, a pre-processing. But why does it really matter? So in here, I'm showing you um, some, um, uh, some information about child-centered speech and our re uh, the research that is ongoing right now. So we have these day-long recorders. As I told you before, we just uh, put the recorder in, in a vest and then the kid, um, the kid um, just wears the vest and he or she... Um, spends the time uh, wearing that vest and we can record from 20 minutes up to nine hours or, or so. So there is a lot of information there. But why is it so difficult? So let me just um, show you some examples of this kind of recordings. No, don't touch them. That, that is a calendar. You want to look at the calendar? So this one is the easiest example ever. Baby. Don't leave. I'm sorry. Let, let me show you a, a, a more uh, a more challenging example. Okay, let's see. 
is here. Or not? Sorry, okay, let me go back a little bit. Oops. Okay, 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 now it is. Okay, so this is the simplest example. No, don't touch them. That, that, that is a calendar. And then um, let's uh, take a look at uh, another one that is a little bit more challenging. Baby, don't lick it. Lick it, stop. That is stop. Not. You know what? I think other kids touch this, and if they got germs. And now lower the volume of, of your headsets, just in case. It's here. Yeah. Okay, Wait, Susan. Oh, okay. You are safe. You are safe. So as you can see, there are different events happening at the same time. So with this kind of, of scenario, uh, the derivation error rate for all of the systems really, really drop, as we can see in the next slide. So these are the results for the speaker derivation and um, for two different data sets. So this is the seedlings. Seedlings, um, as I told you before, belongs to the die hard uh, evaluation. And um, if, if you remember the derivation error rate um, in average, there were around um, 20, 20 something. Um, and you can see that for the kids using even the Oracle BAD, the results are around 32%, which is very, very high. It can be affected by uh, many factors, of course, uh, because it is a noisy scenario because of the annotations, but that is what, what we have to deal with. Um, the people from, uh, from cognitive science and also from uh, linguistics usually tell me, Paola, we don't have like deaf and eval data. We just have eval data, and that is true. Um, all the uh, uh, all the data that uh, they can give us is the eval data that we are not uh, sure how it's going to uh, perform in our systems. This is another example. This belongs to the uh, BLIP data from NTU. Um, the goal of this uh, study was to do uh, to extract the different languages in the recording. Uh, but we already did the derivation first. So we see that the derivation is around 41%. That is not uh, a very good um, uh, number. But well, not, not all is uh, as bad as the derivation for these scenarios. We also have the language derivation, as, I, uh, as we discussed before, with the X vector uh, self attention. So we are getting a nice accuracy and also a nice uh, equal error rate. We just got these results, I think, uh, last week. So these ones are very, very good news. So at least we are able to, to say uh, uh, what languages uh, are in those, in those recordings and at what time. Apart from that, I have been involved in a project uh, that is um, focused on child development. It's from the Center for Child Wellbeing and Development in Zurich. Uh, it is also connected to the UNICEF. And they said that there is a loop, um, the child and adolescent under development as existing programs struggle to deliver the right intervention at the right time. And it is important to break this loop. And how are we gonna do that is to employ um, all the technology, all the technology that we have to really um, uh, get customized um, information, timely response, and tailor for the needs of each child and adolescent. So let me show you again one of these recordings. V, guys, let's go. So can you recognize um, the language or the country? Yes, no. <laughs> so this one is a little, a little bit tough. So I can tell you that the location is Malawi, the language is Chichewa. And from these recordings, we plan to analyze the aspects of uh, adult child and child, child communications. And there is a lot to do here. We have to do a lot of things for the derivation, like the uh, number of speakers, the amount of adult speech, the amount of child speech, the uh, conversational uh, uh, turns, 
uh, and so on. And from the ASR, uh, we are going to need uh, to get like the, the, of course, the transcriptions first and then the different number of words, the complexity of the utterances and the type of questions. So uh, we are still uh, in the data collection. I have been doing some darization um, for this uh, for these recordings. And let me tell you that is very, very difficult. And lastly, I don't know if we still have uh, time. I think uh, uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, it's all yeah, almost. We have, um, we have more than 15 minutes. OK. And, okay. And, but you might want to leave time for questions. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it will just take me like five minutes to say to say something more. Um, I know that you like spoilers. Well, I like spoilers. So I'm going to give you two spoilers. So no questions on this uh, on these topics, but I will tell you uh, some things about this. So this is the continuation of the EM neural darization. So we are now switching towards multi-channel. And um, for the multi-channel, well, we, we know that we can just like distributed microphones. And for this new approach, we are replacing the transformers in the EEN uh, with the spatial, spatial temporal encoders and the attention encoders, similar to the, something that is done in uh, speech separation. And um, this work also shows a model adaptation method using only a single channel recordings because remember that we have a lot of single channel data out there and how to make the adaptation possible. That's also one of the goals of this research. And there is something more that this method can be useful in hybrid meetings. So that means if we have multiple microphones in a table, but also some people connecting by Zoom. So um, this is the method that you might want to use. And uh, there is another spoiler about the dual mode language identification. So uh, remember that we were doing language derization. So what, uh, what we wanted to do now is how to address the short utterances. So we already spoke about the expect or self-attention. Um, and um, now we are proposing to have um, a kind of a teacher-student uh, scenario with a dual mode controlled by the uh, KD loss in here that can really um, tackle the very short utterances of uh, from one to three seconds. And we can investigate the impact of this um, uh, short uh, uh, clips or segments of the, of the uh, speech in a linguistic way and also in a lexical way. Okay, so the takeaways from, from the talk, as you can see, there are lots of flavors uh, of darization to choose from. We have huge improvements, but we are not yet, yet there. We have uh, a huge problem uh, uh, in day long recordings and how to address darization in noisy conditions. I think that neuron darization is becoming as good as embedding clustering methods. The overlap detection is still an ongoing research. A speaker imbalance is also um, uh, one of the open questions. So what happens if we have a speaker that uh, is only talking for a, a few seconds? What we should do with that? Um, so the darization can help other down, downstream tasks as we saw before. We have also to focus on day long recordings, cocktail party scenarios that really need um, darization solutions. And now that the self-supervised uh, learning is getting very popular, perhaps uh, darization can be a new direction. I already saw some, some papers uh, in, in that scenario, but well, uh, it is good to know that uh, self-supervised um, can also help uh, darization. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Merci. Um, this is a great talk. Um, we And we have some time for questions. Um, I, I will keep mine for a little bit. I think Shinji was the fastest. Why, why don't you start, Shinji? 
Uh, thank you, Paula, for the great talk. And uh, I really kind of, as always, I, I'm impressed by your talk. And of course, you know, some of the part, uh, the realization part, I kind of know, uh, the also know this uh, kind of work. But the, the my question is uh, the, the language uh, diarization realization part then. Um, so first, language diarization realization problem. Do we know the uh, the languages uh, in advance? Which languages are spoken in? Yeah, yeah. For our work, yes, we we already know uh, what are the languages. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this means that we also don't have a, a, lang a permutation problem. Like no, we don't have. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. We don't have a permutation problem because we know in, the, in advance what uh, what are the languages. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then the, my kind of a question is: Yes, I I understand that, but then the the in some cases, you know, I don't know whether this kind of application is important, but the, in some cases, we have some recordings and we don't know uh, which languages and we don't know how many languages, but we want to somehow uh, the, the, uh, the diarize. It, in this case, it, it's quite similar to the, uh, the speaker diarization realization problem, right? But then maybe later, after check the cluster and then we may kind of you know, uh, label it as a, as a some specific language and so on. So I think this kind of application would also be uh, very interesting. And then my question is, you know, whether if I just, we just simply using the, uh, the, the uh, permutation, uh, the free, uh, the, and the, uh, the encoder decoder attractor uh, based uh, the, the E and apply to this kind of program. And then whether we could, how to say, diarize uh, the language and also detect how many languages that's uh, spoken in the recording. Uh, what do you think about this direction? Uh, yeah, I think we have already done that as well. Um, I think these are the kind of, of results in here. Uh, so this is essentially the E end, right? This is the bidirectional E, 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 e end, and this one is the self-attention. So you're talking about this one, essentially. So of course we know in advance uh, what are the uh, languages that are being spoken. Um, so that is like one of the limitations that we have right now, but uh, sure, that will be a good direction to, to follow uh, and like defining another class. And I think um, uh, that we also have like one experiment that was mistakenly done where we just had like uh, to distinguish between English and let's say Gujarati, and then somehow uh, the system came up that uh, it was not Gujarati because the, um, the recording was Telugu, for example. So mm -hmm. we were, uh, we were uh, clearly recognizing the English, but we were not uh, recognizing the Telugu. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. And there was a, a question on the chat. Uh, if I summarize it, uh, this uh, was the question of like, we, we see a lot of these neural diarization approaches. There are some of the classic approaches in the past. Um, are they succeeding all at the same place? Are they failing all at the same place? Or is there some differences? And if there are, what are they? Uh, what are the cases where neural diarization may work? better um, and hopefully it's not the answer like uh, it always depends on data set which which we probably is but uh, do you have some intuitions about when is it that neural networks really uh, get things done and maybe the classic approach still works well in certain cases yeah uh, yes so um both are quite competitive, as we can see here. Let me show the one with the overlap that is uh, essentially what we want to, to talk about. So this one is the traditional, the traditional approach. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then we have the end-to-end -end approaches. The, so the, the next two lines are the end-to-end -end approaches. And then we have the one that is the combination, a hybrid system between uh, a traditional approach and also the E end approach. Uh, but um, I think that all of them are quite competitive. The only thing with the e, with the end to end approaches is that it takes longer to train them. So you have to be also very uh, have like a, a good computers, good GPUs. Uh, and, and, but but as, as you can see, all of them 
are uh, quite uh, quite similar. Sometimes they get better results. Sometimes that they they are uh, they are getting worse, but they are quite close from one another, as you okay. can see here. And also, let me show you the graph for the die hard. Um, uh, sorry that I didn't bring uh, the, die, the uh, graph for the die hard three with the DNNs uh, as shown uh, in here for the difference of corpora. But for all the systems, the most uh, challenging scenarios are the vast and the seedlings uh, and also the restaurant um, scenario. Uh, so the vast is uh, YouTube videos, the seer is a restaurant, the seedlings is a child center speech. All of them um, have noise. All of them have a lot of overlapping uh, speech. So those ones are the, the things that are the limiting the improvement of these systems, even for um, the uh, Die Hard 3. Okay, so you the um, so empirically we see improvements. We see improvement when we put all of these uh, together. So that must mean that there are cases where one system is uh, do, uh, giving different prediction than the other. Um, and that's why the uh, fusion of those four approaches work. Do you have a feeling of like, is one better? Is the end-to-end -end better in the overlapping speech and the others is better in some other situation? We, or it needs more analysis to understand why we saw that improvement with the uh, merge of those four approaches or that mixture of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh... I think that for the overlapping speech, the end to end approaches work better because they naturally give you uh, the overlap uh, labels as uh, shown in here. So you don't have to do like any overlap detection on any overlap assignment. So it naturally gives you uh, the overline posterior, um, the, yeah, the uh, speaker posterior for each of the frames. So that is one of the things that I wanted to talk about. And uh, that is not possible for the usual uh, traditional systems. Although the, the traditional systems, if you have the, the um, uh, best uh, embeddings, if you select the, the embeddings correctly, and if you have like a good uh, backend, you can also get good results. That, that, is, that is also for, for sure. But uh, the, as I said before, the end-to-end um, uh, -end approaches are getting there and are also getting closer to what we expect from uh, the traditional systems. And uh, are right now, I can say that both of them are the state of the art, depending on the application. For example, if we have um, uh, a task where we don't have like a lot of overlap, then the traditional system will be, will be quite good. But if we have a, uh, um, um, some recordings that contain like a lot of overlap and our system is not able to really detect uh, the overlaps of multiple uh, persons at the same time. So it is better to use uh, the E end. Although um, as we can see in the, in the results, because these ones are uh, the, the final results for, for the, the die hard. So we can observe that in the end, globally, if we mixed all of the possibilities of the difference of corpora that includes from one speaker up to, I think nine or 10 speakers at the same, uh, in the same recording, uh, the, the results are quite competitive with one another. Nice. Okay. Now that's a good answer. Uh, Laurie, I forgot for time if we wanted to um, be mindful of, because there are a few more questions, but we could also share them directly with Paolo, Paola um, uh, via um, email. We, we have five minutes and it's also, if we go a couple minutes over, that's okay. Okay, great, great. Uh, it seems that, uh, uh, so, so there's a uh, Billy who's uh, uh, sharing, in fact, two questions. I will, I will start with one and, and if we have time also with the other. But I, I think the first one was a bit more practical, like uh, data set like the seedlings, uh, although uh, very interesting and, and challenging, but it, it is limited a little bit in size. Did you manually label more data? Is there more of these? Uh, I, think, I think we're always hungry for more data. Uh, I, we were, I think, uh, curious about that, yeah. 
Yes, so we were using the seedlings data that was provided by the diehard. So we have the ground truth for that one, but we also have like a private collection that probably will be released uh, late this year, hopefully, so that we can have more data. And uh, uh, so this was manually annotated. So um, annotation, I think is one of the hardest work ever because you have to really have a consensus on where is a speech and where is non-speech. So yeah, we have like kind of uh, enough data to, uh, to do some kind of, of experiments with respect to uh, child uh, centered speech. Um, but uh, what, what we are also doing is um, the, some kind of adaptation. These ones are already trained only using uh, seedlings data, and these were also uh, performed using a mixture of uh, seedlings and bleep to get these results. Uh, but we also have uh, some studies how to do the adaptation uh, from um, adult uh, uh, data sets to make it work for, for kids, although it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Okay, and I, I will uh, take another follow-up question from Billy and add my own flavor uh, to that question. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there was a, a lot of interest in the presentation uh, in that RCNN motivated approach. Uh, it, it's kind of a nice uh, different way somewhat to, to look at it. Um, uh, what do you think of other approaches like um, more advanced image-based segmentation methods that could even maybe based on the spectrogram could even like maybe use there? And I, I will add a twist to that question, which like, uh, what about multimodal? Uh, I cannot uh, uh, do a session of question and not ask that, but uh, I was curious, like also, is, is it cheating to start using lips? Uh, and, and if it is cheating, then um, uh, what, 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 what is the, the view from, from the speech community of that uh, aspect of audiovisual speaker diarization, um, getting uh, inspiration from computer vision approaches, I think is a very uh, nice step, but I was curious, like, why not also use uh, vision as an input when available, for sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very nice question. I think that we also have to go multimodal. And right now, for example, the speaker recognition uh, evaluation, that is like um, uh, another challenge that is quite related to, to diarization is using uh, the multimodal uh, approach. So you have the face and also you have the, the audio of the different speakers. So I think that the recession should also move into, into that uh, direction, not only focus on the speech entirely, but try to uh, also use all the uh, other modalities as the image process, as the image uh -huh, or face recognition or lip, rec uh, lip uh, reading lip recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I liked it. Also, you had your last project, which also included Zoom as uh, and, and when you start using these uh, interfaces, the, often this other modality comes for free, almost uh, the visual modality. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we will be very glad to to uh, talk to people that uh, uh, have more knowledge on uh, image processing. Uh, because I remember that when we were doing uh, this, uh, uh, this research, we were deciding on using the STFT or using the MFCCs of what kind of, uh, of features should we extract here or just like the signal or how, 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 how good uh, we have to, to be here to really get an improvement here. Right, mm -hmm. so I will be uh, really glad to talk about also this this stage or how to do the mapping in a better way. Great, so thank you very much, Paula. Thanks a lot. Uh, oh, there are snacks outside. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. Well, thank Laurie. you. Mark. Yeah. You want to say something, Larry? Uh, yeah. For yes, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak, even with your difficult traveling circumstances, we really appreciate it. Thank you, thanks a lot. I'm very sorry I couldn't make it in person.
but thanks a lot. Thank you. We will eat the snacks in your honor. There's cookies mostly done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thank you again, Paula. Thank uh, you. Thank thanks you for a lot. the audience and question. And please feel free to contact directly Paula or uh, if you want locally, Shinji, if you have questions on these topics. Uh, these are very important for many applications. So thank you again for joining us, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.